Okay, so let's start with gender and women's empowerment in agriculture. And um, please feel free to interrupt me if something is not clear. Uh, a lot of this material sort of build up on each other, so it's important to sort of get things clear as we go along. Um, of course, we'll always have, I'll try to leave some time always at the end of each section for, for Q&A, but do feel free to, to interrupt if, you, if something needs clarification. Um, so, so here let's talk a, a bit about why, why address gender. Um, I'll go over some fundamentals of gender analysis, and then, and then I'll, I'll end with the data needs for gender research. So here's my disclaimer at the bottom. These slides are mostly not mine. These are, I am uh, drawing on work uh, by colleagues at IFPRI. IFPRI has done a lot of work on gender and agriculture over the past two decades. And in many, in many ways, they have forged uh, gender analysis in this area. They, they, they were visionaries in this area. And so they've done a lot of work. And here, I did not want to reinvent the wheel. And so my goal here is just as a, um, just pulling all these resources together um, in a way that, that would help you to, to appreciate the con as a context for, for understanding the tool. So, um, so I want to acknowledge uh, the work of Ruth Meinzendick, Agnes Kisumbing, um, Cheryl Doss, Amber Peterman, and others who have co contributed to this work and, and to these slides um, that, I'll, that I'll be sharing with you today. So, so what is this gender thing? So let's try to unpack that, that, that gender thing. So before we start, um, I think it's useful to, to get on the same page about some terminology. So when we say gender, gender are, is a socially constructed relationship, so differences between men and women. So these include the roles, responsibilities, and opportunities associated with being male or female in a given culture. And in a given culture is important because it changes in every place, right? So these characteristics vary among different cultures. These change over time. So what it means to be a man or a woman in our parents' generation is not the same as what it means to be a man and a woman in our generation. And it won't be the same for a kid's experience as well. So this is changing over time. Um, a lot of people interchange gender and sex. That's a mistake. Because sex refers to biological differences. There are innate biological differences between men and women. Um, and that's what we're talking about when we say sex. When we say, uh, when we say gender, OK, I'll get into gen uh, When we say gender, we're talking about the socially constructed relationships. Right? A lot of people also interchange gender with women. And maybe this speaks to the, the point raised earlier, where, where the men. And that's a fair point, because gender is not equal to just women. Um, men are part of gender. So, so you know, whenever there's, there's an analysis that looks only at women, you know, question mark, that should be a red flag. Where, where are the men? Because, because gender is the relationship, right? So you need to, you know, there, you need a reference, men and women. Okay. So um, also, well, traditionally in many societies, women have been in a position of disadvantage. And so we talk about women's empowerment. So women overcoming those disadvantages. So that's what we mean when we're saying women's empowerment. We can also talk about gender equality or gender equity, sort of creating, uh, eliminating the gender gap between men and women, creating equality between men and women. There is no such thing as gender empowerment. Because when you say gender empowerment, who, who are you empowering? Are you empowering the men or are you empowering the women? If you mean empowering the women, say women's empowerment. Um, or if you mean minimizing the gap, say gender equality. But don't say gender empowerment, because that's ambiguous. That's big. We don't know what you mean. Okay? You can say man empowerment, too. And, and in fact, in the way we have a male empowerment score. That's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, rest assured, we do have it. And that would be the correct way to use it. Yeah. So I think as a good practice, use male and female as adjectives. So when you say male something, male worker, male farmer, female worker, female farmer, um, male and female, use those to describe something as an adjective. Use men and women, the terms men and women, to describe adult people or to refer to adult people. So, uh, so as we're not confused with when, when we're talking about uh, gender versus sex, okay? Okay, so what is gender analysis? 
So this is a set of tools for uncovering differences between men and women in order to ensure that our research produces policy recommendations that are appropriate for the needs for both men and women. And which differences matter or are most important depends on the context. Like we said, it's different in place to place. So the emphasis here, and this is maybe one of the key messages I want to impart um, at, in this part of the talk, is that the emphasis is not having the right answer but in asking the right question. Because the right answer is different in every place. Like we said, gender is context specific. So I think when you're doing gender analysis, it's really the, the practice of asking the right questions that will give you um, sort of gender nuance analysis. Okay. And gender, um, let me try to just drag this away because it's, there you go. So, Gender will not always be the most important variable in all contexts. There, there are many social, cultural sort of variables that matter. Gender is just one of them. Gender obviously could, is, is important, and, but it may not be the most important thing. So this is why analysis, you need to do the analysis, right? So there could be other factors, inter-household differences, uh, differences between rich and poor, differences due to ethnicity, those kinds of things. Other sources of inter-household differences, age, birth order, relationship to the head of the household, all kinds of things. Um, so, but then the, only, the other thing to, to recognize is that there are differences. Not all men are the same. Not all women are the same, right? They vary. So, you know, uh, not all women are disadvantaged. It depends on where they are, marital status, widows versus married women, older women versus younger women, their status in the community the size of their land holdings, that sort of thing. In the same way that not all men are, are the same. Some men are more disadvantaged compared to the others. Also very, you know, have varying in different have different characteristics. So you have to look at the intersection of gender with these other variables. So when does it make sense to pay attention to gender in our research? So when there are systematic gender differences in outcomes, like your differentials, poverty rates, health indicators, nutrition outcomes, all, the outcomes, think of the outcomes you're interested in. Um, systematic gender differences in determinants, so land ownership, schooling, headship, those kinds of things, as well as processes, so differences in preferences and motivations for behavior. So these processes, legal processes, institutional processes, there could be gender differences in those things as well. And in, in those cases, it pays attention, it makes sense to pay attention to gender in our research. That pretty much covers a lot of things in our work, right? So um, recently, I would say when I was a grad student, you know, people would say there, there was growing evidence that that said that households don't act as one. I, I, I think now we can say with more confidence that this has been sort of um, confirmed over and over in many different studies. So, um, so the default assumption is no longer a unitary household, but that households do not act as one, that the, the, the individuals within the household have different preferences, have different resources, have different interests. Um, and one share of resources depends on their bargaining power. In general, in many places, um, women control fewer resources than men. Um, there's also some evidence out there that shows that women's assets and incomes are highly correlated with the health and food security of children. So there's evidence to show that when their incomes rise, those are directed towards um, children's outcomes. Uh, some people have, uh, people have found as well that there's a relationship between the gender gap uh, um, and, you know, based on the OECD index, and uh, hunger, so especially education gap in sub-Saharan Africa. So the, the smaller the gap, so the more gender equal um, education is, the less likely you have uh, hunger. Um, so what does this mean? So improving access to assets for women can increase agricultural productivity, food security, children's nutrition, health, and education. So those are, those are some of the implications. Um, there was a recent FAO report uh, the, in 2011, the state of food and agriculture. So this is the SOFA. What I'm referring to here is the SOFA report. So here are some of the key, key messages from that report. Uh, and, and really what they highlight is that agriculture is highly gendered in developing countries. So in that report, they talk about how women make up a large percentage of, of the agricultural labor force, and we know this. Uh, but but what, was, what was interesting in that study is now we know how much. They actually they, they busted some myths 
uh, they, a lot of people throw around some numbers, but, but what they found was that on average worldwide in developing countries, this is about 43%. And then in Africa, it's about 50%. So about half the agricultural labor force is women. Women are disadvantaged in productive asset ownership and control of productive inputs. Um, there are gender differences in base education levels, access to services, especially extension and natural resource knowledge. And that female farmers produce less than men, not because they are less efficient or able farmers necessarily, but that because they lack equal access to resources. So here's um, so in one of the background papers by Amber Peterman and, and colleagues, what they did was to do a systematic review of empirical studies on um, access to inputs and productivity, pro agricultural productivity. And the numbers you find here, so the bars are the number of studies, and then the, the numbers inside the, the columns are numbers of studies. So the blue areas are, um, so here, the blue areas are uh, studies that have found that men have an advantage in those inputs. The, the ones in orange are studies that have found that women have an advantage in, those in, in access to those inputs. And the grays are where there was no statistical difference found. And overall, so here you see technology related to input use, access to water and soil management, access to ag extension, ag labor, access to social capital. So across all of these, um, in about 40% of the studies, men were found to be favored, statistically significant. Um, uh, uh, um, greater access to these inputs compared to women. In about 60% of the studies, the studies did not detect a statistical difference. And in like a handful of studies, they some have found that women were favored. So that's, that's a very interesting um, a finding. So what does this mean? Well, by closing the gender, if, we, if we're able to close the gender resource gap, there could be massive implications for agricultural productivity. You could have a productivity boost. Um, so this is sort of a hypothetical um, thinking experiment. Uh, women could increase productivity on their farms by 20 to 30 percent. If you give them access, the same access as men have, productivity would rise by 20 to 30 percent. That would raise total output at the national level by two and a half to four percent. That's huge at the national level. Uh, so productivity gains of this magnitude have potential to reduce hunger. Uh, by 12 to 17 percent, that's 100 to 150 million people uh, out of hunger. Uh, so, so that's that's significant. Um, and then, of course, if you know, if these correlations hold about women spending um, more of their resources and income <coughs> towards other well-being, well-being of the rest of the household, then you could have multiplier effects on broader economic and social realms. So, you could have increases in in child outcomes as well as a potential. So this is just hypothetical, but that's the implication of, of eliminating the gender resource gap. So in case you're still sleepy or, <laughs> <laughs> or need some comic relief, I found this really funny cartoon from one of the older uh, gender presentations. So since we're talking about resources, so I'll give you I'll give you a moment to appreciate it. Um, but you know the point is that women Women are, you know, in many places, and maybe you know, before in history, women have have been assets to farm production. Um, oh, sorry, except they can't use her as collateral. So, so now let's get to, to value chains. So, that, so so far, what I've talked about is just agriculture in general. Um, this is a value chains training. So let me give you some examples of, um, uh, well, some thoughts on value chains. So. I think hopefully you, all of you here are convinced that, that gender is important and that inclusive agricultural sector growth is important. It's important to include the women in agricultural sector growth. Um, and in the value chain approach, what's, uh, the question is how do you get to a gender sensitive value chain? You'll have to look at the whole picture. So you'll, you'll, you'll take a look at legal policy environments, access to and information about markets, local capacity and support. And this is the, the key question. I want to, to pose to you, what then do we mean by having gender sensitive value chains and what would that look like? So this is exactly, I'm glad you, you brought that up because that's the women in development approach. The criticism for that approach was just, it was just adding women in, in STIRT. And so it, 
in this case, so basically here you have value chains, and then you just say, oh, how do we include the women? So maybe let's invite them to the training. Or let's say, so it's sort of more of an afterthought. And then people get surprised, like nobody showed up. The women didn't show up. So, oh, women are not farmers. Because we invited the farmers and the women didn't show up. So, so that's the criticism of this approach, right? So, 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 so let me, so let me talk about this. So, what, what do, what do we mean by uh, a gender sensitive, a gender equitable value chain program, a gender sensitive value chain program? So, this would be a value chain program that supports gender equity goals. So, um, there should be an understanding of men and women's differential roles and relations. It should foster equitable participation. It should address the needs of women, support women's economic advancement, promote gender equitable market-driven solutions, design equitable benefit sharing mechanisms, and include men in addition to women. So in defining both the problem and the solution, you cannot have uh, something that's effective without understanding how men and women are different and how they Does that? Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So, so this is this this is the alternative model I would suggest is is more is more effective, where you don't have the value chains and then you just try to figure out how you add women, but instead you integrate the gender analysis into into the value chain. So here are just some steps. Um, so how do you integrate gender? Um, so phase one would just be mapping gender relations and roles along the value chain. So just trying to understand where, where do women and men fit, and then identifying what are their constraints, and understanding that their constraints are different. What are the consequences of those constraints? And what can be done to remove those constraints? So for example, if women cannot access markets because they cannot travel alone, whereas the men can travel alone, how can you give, how can they access markets in the same uh, way as the men? There should be other, that maybe there should be alternative means of transportation or there should be alternatives, you know, they should get a transportation allowance. For example, if the, the transport the women can access costs different than the men because the men can go on a bicycle and the women cannot because they don't have bicycles. These are just examples, right? But there could be potentially a lot of different constraints that are experienced differently by women and men. Or maybe the women need to bring the children and it has to be within, you know, it has to be in daylight, they cannot go in the evening, Th that sort of thing, right? So there needs to be some thought about how those constraints can be addressed in the, pro in the program so that you can, get, you can get gender equitable participation and you can get gender equitable benefits. And then part phase five, and this is where the way a tool comes in, measure success. And by measuring, meaning monitor what happens and see if it's effective. So you know what to do again and what not to do again. Okay. So here's an example. So, uh, and I, I apologize because I was going to look up where I, where what what country this example was from, but I totally forgot in the rush of the morning. So this is this is from one of the USAID projects. It's a honey value chain, but this is just to illustrate how gender um, could be integrated in in a value chain analysis. So so here's the honey value chain. We have you know, the different steps in production. We have inputs, production of the honey, traders, processing and packaging, and then it goes to local markets, international markets. And then in each step, you have these exam um, what components of that step, right? Um, the different inputs, the different production, um, uh, or the different inputs in production, the different um, actors, or the different um, institutions, or information in that's required in this step. Anyway, so, so we have those in the bubbles on top. And then at the bottom, we have some data. We have some information. So in under inputs, we have 90% hive production, 10% protective material. In production of honey, we have 90% come from family farms, 10% uh, come from small-scale producers. In the trader step, we have 90% are home-based, 10% are small-scale traders. Under processing, all of that is home-based and then it goes to the market. Okay, I'll give you a second to just look because some of the type is a little small for the people at the back. Okay, so what questions would you ask to gain a better understanding of how to focus the project in order to support gender integration? 
So, right, who does what? So here's an example where some people have worked on this and said, okay, so let's mark the blues are, are male and then the shares of the male and the reds are the shares of the female. And they've marked up, okay, so under high production, we, 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 we discovered that 60% are male contributed and 30% women. So in every step, they've disaggregated. This is kind of what, what you were asking, right? And trying to understand how, how do women contribute in each step. Uh, what's not here is what Sarah said, which are the hidden equities, and that's that's definitely something that could be important, something to think about. How would you include that here, and which stage of the process do they, does it belong to? Questions? Shall I keep going? Okay, good. All right, so just broadly, so broadly, when we're working in agriculture and doing research in agriculture and gender, there, there are sort of generally two, two sets of questions. So one is, how do we improve agricultural productivity? And that could be the particular value chain you're interested in. How does gender fit in? And how do changes in agricultural production affect women and girls and men and boys? So these fit, as I said, into broader questions about the role of agriculture in development. And I'm, gonna, I'm now going to segue into the data needs for gender research. So as you've seen in just the value chain example, to be able to answer those questions, what you need is more disaggregated data. So you, you generally need more data at the individual level. Just want to know who does what. Um, you also need information on how institutions and structures are experienced differently by men and women, and how this impacts well-being of individuals and communities. So to understand the processes a little bit better, so you don't just you know, look at individual level data, you may also need to have a better sense of how these interactions happen. So let, there are many, obviously, many possible units of analysis. It could be at the individual level, so the farmer or the worker or, or the individual uh, or the child. Um, there's, uh, uh, you, could, you could do analysis at the household level. You could do analysis at the intra-household level, which is within looking at dynamics within the household, so, so males versus females within the same household, for example, um, community level, regional, national level. You can do analysis by plot. Um, if there are multiple plots and multiple plots, uh, uh, different, different crops are grown on different plots, you can do it at the plot level. So for example, the World Bank surveys, the Living Standard and Measurement surveys uh, are, are the agricultural modules are collected at the plot level, so you can certainly do analysis. That, that analysis can be done at the plot level. It could be at the resource unit if you're looking at water resources or forest. Um, that could be the unit of analysis. It could be institution. It could be groups or management units, um, community level, or yeah, no, community. I have community. Or it could be at the value chain, which is sort of all the actors along the chain for a particular uh, product. Okay, so, so let me just go into more depth about comparing individual level analysis versus household level analysis versus plot level, just to give you an idea of how, how these level, levels of analysis differ. So typically, and this is sort of a very common approach, especially if you don't have a lot of individual level data, is you do, ha you do analysis at the household level. There are a lot of outcomes as well that are, that are at the household level, like standard of living or um, poverty, that sort of thing. So here you would have, say, um, a couple, a married couple, male and female, or uh, which we call a female-headed household, usually, or a female-headed household. And you would compare differences between the male-headed production, for example, agricultural production in the male-headed household versus agricultural production in the female-headed household. That's household-level analysis. Uh, there could be others in the household as well. Um, so this would include like other adults or children. So at the individual level, what you're looking at are the outcomes for each person, right? So for the in in the male-headed household, this would be that you would be interested in the household, uh, the outcome for the male head, the spouse, and every other individual in the household. Assuming you know, if you're interested in everybody who's working in the farm, for example, um, in a female-headed household, same thing. Right? You'd look at the individual. So that's what we mean by individual. So you're looking at men and women outcomes. So that's the individual analysis. 
You can also do plot level analysis. So assuming you know if you have information on what plots this person works on, so some could be male managed plots, some could be female managed plots, and some could be jointly managed plots. So the jointly managed plot, for example, here would be the purple, and then the other the male managed plots are the ones in blue, the female managed plots are the ones in red. So you could do analysis at plot level. Okay. Okay. So so what are the so so what let's define a little bit what these household types are. So in the male headed households, there are actually two two kinds. In in the women's empowerment and agriculture index, we use dual adult. That that's a term we move we're moving away from headship, uh, calling them hat male-headed or female-headed. So we're describing them as dual adult households. So here you have a male and a female uh, primary decision maker. Um, so under male-headed households, you could actually have a dual adult households where you have a male and a female or a male-only adult, uh, a male-only household where you only have a male decision maker, no female. This is actually quite rare. Um, and when we, they were doing the pilots in the original way, they didn't find any male-only households, so they're actually not included in, in the way of surveys. It, so Feed the Future does not sample male-only households. Although I know for a fact that there are some countries where the, you know these types of households exist. So definitely, again, pay attention to context. If this is a, a household type that exists in the area you're working with, by all means, you need to pay attention to those, how, how they're different. Right? Um, let's distinguish between marital status and and who makes decisions, right? Because yeah. I think what the reason in the way we we're moving away from headship is that um, in the way when we have a dual adult household, they may, they don't necessarily have to be married right. couples. It right. could be uh, a, a male and uh, a daughter-in-law, or a, or a, or a mother and the son or a mother and a son-in-law, okay. it could be any two, so the, in the way, uh, at least, uh, of course this is more general, but in the way, uh, the way we identify respondents for the survey, who we call the dual adult decision makers, are self-identified primary male and primary female decision makers. So we ask them, who makes the important decisions here? If it's the mother, then she's the respondent, it's not the wife. So, so not always is it the wife. There are some cases, so it depends on your project, right? <coughs> If you care about the, you know, the, the, the couple, the married couple, then you would say, okay, if you are the male respondent, then your wife is the female respondent. So, so those are all sort of possible, right? But the idea here is that here when we say male-headed households or female-headed households, there's actually some differences between those household structures, depending on whether there's another adult there or not. So, Sorry, sorry, Sarah. Uh, my, my question was about polygamous households. Okay. Good, right? Good question. Um, they don't fit necessarily in this, uh, right? So it's like, who are the decision? We, we run into this problem actually in our Uganda survey. And the problem is, it would be great to be able to survey all the wives because they all, they're all sort of making decisions as well. But usually you don't have the budget to interview more than a couple, right? More than one. So there are a few options. One is to interview the most senior wife. The other option is to randomly choose a wife. You pull the names out of a hat, or you introduce, or you interview all of them, right? So if you can't interview all of them, then you have to decide. But that could, that could be decided ahead of time. And definitely, you shouldn't go into a survey without knowing that polygamy would be a, that this household structure would be an issue. That would be very bad. You should have discovered that in your pretests. So let me get to the female adult type uh, households. Female headed. What we're call, what we're calling female headed households. So there are two types. One we call the de jure female headed households, meaning that it's just really the woman. There's no other male in the household. Or it's a de facto female headed household because the male is not in the household. So this is where that sort of fits in. So if it fits into a different, our definition of the household, uh, it fits into the household, is, so it's like it's not in one compound, all the wives are not in one place, they have their own sort of separate dwellings and separate households, then maybe because she's the second wife, she's married, but because she's making the decisions in her sort of homestead, she is a de facto 
uh, female-headed household with a male in the, in the background. Um, in some places, this is very common in, pla in a lot of places where there's a lot of male migration. So the male migrate, they send remittances to varying degrees, or they just you know stop coming home, and the woman ends up sort of becoming the default sort of production manager so, for the household, right? So that's that's what we call de facto. So the point here is that this the, a household that looks like this, female only with no other male, is very different from a female that has another male that could be sending remittances or could be involved in decisions to some extent. And that should be something you need to be aware of. So just some data. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, based on like EPOD data, I think this is outdated, but I couldn't find an updated number. About one, one in three households are, are classified as female-headed. Um, and in the least developed countries, about one in four. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's likely more likelihood of, of having finding female-headed households compared to other least developed countries. So uh, just to go back to analysis, now, we, uh, you know, excellent discussion on, on, on the different household types. So usually, so what people have found when doing um, analysis between these households, household types, so in a de jure female-headed household versus in a dual adult household, so male-headed, a typical, let's say, male-headed household, usually the female-headed household would lack male labor. They have no man to make or share decision making, so they're decision makers by default. They may have, or you know, because there's nobody else, they may have less secure land tenure if they have to depend on the man for land access in some places. They are often poorer, but asterisk not all the time because sometimes the reason they re they maintain they remain female headed is precisely because they can afford to remain female headed as opposed to being absorbed in another household or going back to their natal families or remarrying, for example. Um, but yeah, there, some, in some places they could be poorer or, or not. What are the other differences? There could be differences in education, asset ownership, time and labor constraints, precisely because you don't have male input, lab, labor inputs, right? Access to markets could be different. So if this is the sort of analysis you're doing, check your descriptive statistics. Pay attention to what specific differences uh, are, are there with respect to female-headed households compared to women as a whole. Okay. Now for the de facto household, female-headed household, so remember the de facto is there's a man in the picture, it's just that there's another other circumstances for why the woman is the de facto female head. So the man is involved to some degree but mostly absent. So it could be a migrant for example. Um, they may receive remittances, which relieve some wealth or cash constraints, but there's variable degree of man's involvement in decision making. Now, remember, these, the de jure, and so the point here, uh, and the, the reason I'm, I'm spending a lot of time here is that you sometimes people sort of put these two together, and, and maybe their constraints are actually different, mm -hmm. both institutionally as well as in terms of resources and it. So to do a proper gender analysis, you need to be cognizant of the household types. Why is it a female-headed household? And then go from there. Okay. So, so that, that's the household level analysis. Um, now here, individual level analysis. So when you're doing individual level analysis, you're looking at differences between men and women of different ages within as well as across households. So you're looking at individual as the unit of analysis. So this can also lead to looking at youth issues because you're looking at individuals, right? So it's not just the male head or female head. You could be looking at other adults or other other or young people. So don't assume youth is just young men. There's also female youth. So male and female youth could be part of your analysis. Um, there. So again, you know, again, the reason why individual analysis makes sense is because we cannot assume that households act as one. So not everybody in the household have the same objectives, preferences, resources, production, or income within the household. So different people contribute different things. They could have compatible or opposing preferences and behaviors and motivations, right? So in the individual level analysis, this can come through. Um, so you could have constraints that are in specific to the individual, you could have, um, you know, outputs or, or indicators that are specific to the men and women, say, 
um, uh, or yeah, according to what activities they participated. Um, and I think maybe the next slide would be more useful. Can I move on? I see some sure. people are writing. Okay, let me just move on. Okay, so that's the individual level analysis. Plot level analysis go, goes a step further. So you're not just collecting in, um, information at, or analyzing at the individual level, but analyzing at the plot level. So if an individual, you know, cultivates multiple plots and those different plots have different crops and different, you know, characteristics, then you do the analysis at the plot level. So you would include plot managers, so that could be a man or a woman, they could be young or old, they could have different assets, um, and you could look at, at the plot level what sort of technology they're using, how productive they are, what their returns are, and um, especially for projects that are looking at new technology, so say introducing uh, a, a high value crop or a new crop or new techniques in, in, uh, to increase productivity in a specific, uh, a specific product, um, then this gives you a better idea because you're doing analysis at the plot level. Different plots could have different characteristics. You have plots that are more fertile, you have marginal plots, and those things can vary. So one is who do you interview? Very important because who you interview, that's the source of your information. So if they're if you choose properly, then you can get a good information. If you don't choose, if you if you don't think about who you're who you're interviewing, then you, you may run into some problems. And then the second is if you're interviewing more than one person, so if you're doing the in individual level and the plot level analysis, how do you handle data from multiple people within the household? And I think this speaks to his point. Like, okay, there are multiple people, how do we handle it? So there are a few options. So first on who should be interviewed. So this is the first challenge. Um, so one question is, does sex desegregated mean, data mean we have to interview multiple people per household? Actually, no. You could have individual, you know, surveys happen all the time where you have a roster, you're getting individual level data across all the people, but you just have one respondent. So it doesn't, it's different. It, uh, there was the choice of the respondent and the date, the analysis, the level of analysis are actually distinct issues. So not necessarily that you need to interview multiple people in the household, although there are some times when that actually makes sense. If you are interested in who the farmer is and the farmer are multiple, there are different farmers in the household, you may want to interview each farmer separately. So that's what we mean by data at the individual level. Um, so as I said, many household surveys interviews one person, often the household head. Now, the problem with that is that you're assuming that they know everything. Mm -hmm. And maybe in some cases that's true, in some cases that's not. So um, so if you're only interviewing one person, identify the respondent based on roles and responsibilities, such as the primary farmer. Who knows, who has the most accurate information on what the kids are eating? Are you going to interview the male head? Not, maybe not necessarily, right? Depends. It depends on what the question is. So think about who should be interviewed. And then for analysis, you could compare um, male-headed, female-headed, and couple-headed. Um, so, so, you know, for interviews that only have one respondent, um, you could compare according to household structure. So the household structure are the household types. So is it, is it male, is it couple-headed, dual adult-headed household? Is it male-only household? Is it a female-headed that's, that's de facto or de jure? Is there a male adult in the household or not? So the idea is if you're an analyzing uh, a survey like this where you're only comparing across different types of headship, you know, because you only have you interviewed just one person, for example, then you make sure that you understand what the difference is between a woman who's heading a household with no man versus a woman who has a migrant husband or who has a telephone, uh, what is it, a telephone farmer husband. <laughs> that is different, right? Okay, so that was, so far we talked about interviewing just the one person and getting individual level data based on one respondent. So the other option is to interview multiple people in the household. And we're actually already talking about this as we were talking, the last, talking about the last slide. So who are the multiple people you should interview? So you could interview a principal couple, so this is where the couple-headed terminology comes from. So you can interview both the husband and the wife, right, in, 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 when they're both there. 
you could interview one man and one woman and they could maybe not necessarily be a couple like in the way so it's the primary male decision maker primary female decision maker whether or not they're a couple or it could be one or two randomly chosen people in the household that's possible as well or everyone or you can interview everyone relevant for a specific module so ask each person about their own asset ownership ask each person about their own farming activities or livelihood activities so you could interview everyone in the household who is the best person to answer certain parts of the module right ask every person about what they ate if you're interested in nutrition so when you're interviewing multiple people within the household, so what's the goal? So you want a more complete picture of the household. So yeah, the idea is if you're interviewing like the, the household head, the question is, does that person have all the information you, you're interested in? And if not, then maybe you should interview more than one person. Um, so for example, for things such as gender differences in roles and responsibilities, can you expect the man to be able to give you information on what the constraints of the of the women are in the household maybe they're not obviously the best person because they don't experience those constraints they can speak about their own constraints but not necessarily about the, the women's constraints in the household so when you're interested in gender in general you want to interview both the women the men and the women separately because they have different experiences and different perspectives the other point is hidden information from spouses so maybe, you know, they don't necessarily share all the information. The woman is keeping a pig in the neighbor's house. And actually, we, this is an anecdotal <laughs> story from Ghana. Because I was like asking, do they actually share full information? To this? Or the man has some windfall income and doesn't sh tell the wife. Yeah. And they just spend it, you know. Yeah. Right? The reason you'd want to interview them separately or or first of all, to interview multiple people, is if when you're trying to get at differences in perceptions. So if perceptions are important, especially on women's empowerment, where the woman's own perception is important, you'd want to get their own point of view. You wouldn't want to ask the husband, is your woman empowered? <laughs> you would want to ask the actual person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They may not have the same opinion. They may have different perceptions. Maybe he thinks she's empowered and she doesn't think so, or vice versa, right? So if you're interested in perceptions, then you'd want to ask the person you're actually interested in. So some examples of interviewing multiple people. So um, this is a project that Cheryl Doss and Karen Grohn and Carmen Diana Deer um, were involved in called the Gender Asset Gap Project. And what they did was to collect individual asset data in Ecuador, Ghana, and Karnataka, India, they had two respondents. So what they did was they did a household inventory first, what all the assets are in the household. So this is a household, like an asset roster for the household. And then they go to the individuals and say, OK, what, is, what are your assets? We know what the household assets are. What are your assets? So they have both household and individual. And they did it separately for the two respondents. But I think they chose randomly on who the respondents are. In the WEA, the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, we have two respondents. They are the primary male and primary female decision makers in the household. And like I said, they get the same questionnaire administered. So there's a the, the thing with the with the WEA, and I'll get into more into this more once we get to that section. But um, it's 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 embedded in a larger survey. So the WEA is not a standard standalone module. It's a module you add on to your existing survey. So okay. for Feed the Future, they're, they're already doing a large population-based survey. The WEA survey is just another module that they add. So they're collecting same production. They have a roster, demographics. They have production. They have nutrition. They have consumption, expenditures, all kinds of other things, right? And then the, the empowerment module is another section. So the empowerment module doesn't have roster, doesn't have education, because the idea is you already collected that elsewhere. You should have that in your survey already. Okay? So it's only this part that is administered to the two individuals. All the others are administered differently. So different parts of the survey have different respondents. Um, and in the way they get the same, uh, they get the same questionnaire. We'll, we'll get to it when we get to the questionnaire. So how do you analyze data with conflicting answers? So this is the problem when you're, multi when you're interviewing more than one person, you may not get the same answer. And what do you do, right? 
is that a problem? So, so for example, if you're trying to identify who is the owner of this plot, and you ask two people who the owner, and they say something different, then you have a problem because it's the same plot, right? You need to resolve it. So, so there are multiple ways of resolving it. So the idea is to create a decision rule. One is you use only one answer. So you decide who has the best. Oh well, first of all, use one answer meaning you decide which respondent you believe. <laughs> the primary farmer head or the head or the primary income earner or the oldest adult, whose response, if there's conflicting answers, whose response do you believe? Or, so that's one option, you can always do that. Um, number two option is use broadest definition. So if everybody said, oh, I own that plot, oh yeah, and then the other person also say they own it, so use the broadest definition of ownership. So everybody who claims owner is listed as an owner. So if multiple people rec uh, claim that they own the plot, then you you rec you recognize the plot as a jointly owned plot because everybody feels they own it, then it's a jointly owned plot. So that's the second uh, option where you use the broadest definition. So here you're saying that you're not saying that they're wrong because they 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 think they report that they own the land. So you're just saying that actually let's use everyone's information. The third option is to use other information, like marital property rules or other types of information. Depending on the context, what you have in, in that sort of situation, you can use other information to determine who is it has the claim to the land. So we're talking about how to resolve disagreement. Now, in some cases, disagreement is actually fine, and it need not be resolved. So in the case of women's empowerment, when we're really interested in the person's perception of of whether or not they can do things or whether or not they can make decisions. We don't need to reconcile their response to their husbands or to the other persons. We just care about what they think. So in this case, disagreement is fine. The conflicting answers is not an issue. And you, in when you're doing analysis, you could just code households where there are major disagreements. So you just take note of them, see if there's enough, you know, if it's a large number of households that have disagreements, yeah. maybe it's it, it needs further investigation. If not, then you can just leave it as is and not be worried about it. That's it. That can be its own paper, by the way. Yeah, that that could be just one of many papers, right? Just Yeah, just looking at agreement or disagreement. Yeah, yeah. And why do they disagree, right? Like, why this thing and not that? Why just the land and not the, the what to do with crops, for example? For women's empowerment, Perception is actually is actually important. So so there we don't we don't we have an explicit instruction for enumerators saying it's okay for your ad, for the answers to be different. Do not try to force the respondent to conform to the other person's response. That's actually explicit there. Um, okay. So so key messages on the data needs one is when you, whether you interview one or multiple people depends on your research question. So it's worth thinking about. What are you trying to get out of the data? Um, you can interview multiple people if you need it for full information, or if you're interested in differing perceptions, especially you know when you're looking at gender differences in constraints with, uh, and how, how how the household will affect how different perceptions affect household outcomes. Depending on who you interview, you may get different answers, but you need to consider whose answers you need, whose answers um, are relevant to your research question. The most important thing is to be transparent in how you choose. You want to, if you're using a, this, a rule that says, okay, based on this focus group discussion, men don't do weeding, that, you know, document it and say, this is the basis for choosing this. Or if we're saying that we want to use the broadest definition of ownership, document it, put it in a footnote. You know, it, be transparent about how you're choosing um, whose response. And okay, so the last thing I want to say about this section, so this is the end of the intro, intro to the intro. Um, <laughs> why does it make sense to pay, so hopefully uh, now you, you, all of you have an answer. So why does it make sense to pay attention to gender in your research? Better science. You know what happens when you have an omit, omitted bar, variable problem in your analysis? You have biased answers. When you don't take something important into account, you don't get the right answer. So actually, I would argue, and, and I know you know, all know this because you're in this room, is that when we pay attention to gender in our research, we're doing better research. We're doing more rigorous research. So it, it, it results in, in more rigorous 
research, better science. So that's my pitch. So thank you for your attention.